Bhagavato Arahato Samha Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samha Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samha Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Namasahami Good morning, everyone. So, uh, before jumping into a talk, I'd actually like to do another chant, and I'll share the screen. is the three refuges and the eight precepts. So oftentimes when this is taken, uh, when the refuges and precepts are taken, it's a whole ceremony where a senior monk or a senior nun will recite each verse and then uh, people will follow after that person. But here we can just do it together. Um, this morning I'd really like to talk about how to supercharge one's taking of the refuges and precepts and what what that actually means. Um, what are the refuges? Is it just some uh, religious ceremony or what's, what's a deeper meaning? What is one taking refuge with and how can one uh, actually maximize that or explore different ways to make it, uh, make it more potent for oneself and, and other people actually? So we can just do the chant and we'll do the three refuges and the uh, five precepts. Okay. Buddhang saranang chahami Dhammang saranang chahami Sanghang saranang chahami Dutiampi buddhang saranang gachami. Dutiampi dhammang saranang gachami. Dutiampi sanghang saranang gachami. Dutiampi buddhang saranang gachami. Dutiampi dhammang saranang Gachami Tatiampi Sanghang Saranang Gachami Pana Tipata Vera Manisika Padang Samadhyami I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. Adina Dana Vera Manisika Padang Samadhyami I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which has not been given. Kame sumicha chara vera manisika padang samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. Musavada vera manisika padang samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from false and harmful speech. Sura meraya maja pamadatana vera manisika padang samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drinks and drugs which lead to carelessness. Okay, so that is a, uh, a beautiful formula and one thing which I've been experimenting with recently is actually how to bring other people, bring other beings into this act of going for refuge. As I take this, uh, these refuges, as I say, Buddhang Saranangachami, I go to refuge to the Buddha, Dhammang Saranangachami, I go to refuge to the Dhamma, Sanghang Saranangachami. As I say these, uh, I take refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. Uh, what is the relationship between myself and other people, my going for refuge and other people. And uh, I've been experimenting with this, this in the context of uh, a sutta, actually a sutra 
in the Mahayana canon, actually the longest sutta of the Chinese Mahayana canon called the Avatamsaka Sutra. It's a very long sutra. They say it was uh, given at the time right as the Buddha attained enlightenment, and it's 40 chapters long and thousands of pages. There's a new edition by Kalavinka Press, uh, translated by Dharma Mitra. He was translating it for something like over 10 years or possibly longer. Um, and yeah, just a, a total work of devotion on his part. And the chapter in question is the 11th chapter, the pure conduct chapter. And in this chapter, um, there's a specific Buddha. This is common in Mahayana sutras where uh, you've got these other Buddhas. This is something you don't so much find in the Pali Canon, certainly not uh, emphasized, but you have another Buddha giving advice to um, practitioners that throughout the day, basically any time you're doing something, so waking up in the morning, whenever one wakes up or when one wakes up in the morning, one makes the vow or one prays or one has the aspiration. These are just different tr translations. Uh, one makes the vow, may all beings say, wake up to uh, their true natures, wake up to the path, this, this kind of sentiment. And then brushing one's teeth or using the tooth wood, one vows, one makes the vow, brushing my teeth, rinsing my mouth, I aspire to do this and may all beings uh, grow in the Dharma and speak, uh, speak kindly words, this type of sentiment. So basically, anytime you're doing something, uh, you add this mental wish, may all beings you know, do some kind of sy symbolic thing uh, which relates to that act uh, and relates to the path. So uh, combing one's hair, whenever one combs one hair, one makes the vow or one thinks or one prays, may all beings comb away afflictions or something like that. And there are 108 specific ones of these mentioned in that pure conduct chapter of the Abhatamsaka Sutra. Uh, Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh in the book Present Moment, Wonderful, Wonderful Moment, introduces these practices and he has actually adopted them to uh, modern day times. I think he has ones for driving a car or using toothpaste, which is not mentioned in the original, uh, original text, but he's got quite beautiful ones. So brushing one teeth and rinsing one's mouth, one thinks, may all beings speak lovingly. And you can check out his, uh, his different gatha or training verses in that book, Present Moment, Wonderful Moment. But something which is unique there uh, is this wish, may all beings, etc., etc. And if you like, you can practice with that, uh, this whole concept of anytime you do something throughout the day, creatively and spontaneously or writing these down and either following Thich Nhat Hanh's formulas or the Avatamsaka Sutra's formulas or creating your own just wishing at the same time may all beings bringing other beings into one's consciousness more consciously um, but how does this work in a in a poly context in a, in a Theravada context is it appropriate and what would that look like and as we chanted just before the meditation, um, there are suttas where the Buddha mentions sabbe sata sukita hontu, may all beings be happy. Sabbe sata avera hontu, may all beings be free from uh, animosity, from affliction. So sabbe sata, may all beings. So he does use this, and this is uh, a phrase which crops up again and again. So the Buddha does encourage uh, us to conceive and to widen our scope of awareness and to uh, bring others into to have a big mind basically rather than a constricted narrow mind which is frankly probably how most of us are going about most of our days most of the time so um, thinking of this this phrase uh, may all beings um, I found a uh, a specific Pali verse, which is uh, can be translated as, for the benefit and happiness of all beings, 
dot 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 ellipsy or sabe satanang hitaya sukaya so sabha satanang uh, of all beings hitaya for the benefit sukaya for the happiness and you can just append this wish to anything you do especially something that you do formulaically so i'm just going to leave this uh, little gold speech bar uh, up for the rest of the talk because it's a beautiful wish and it's for me it's a very, uh it's somewhat of a new wish and uh, i'm figuring out myself how to uh, relate to this intentional uh, mind expansion and so when i go for refuge so as a buddhist monk or as buddhist practitioners uh, you've probably or even as just people who've been to monasteries even if you're not a practitioner you may have seen this ceremony um, or what we just did the the refuges so i take refuge in the buddha so what would it mean if you append this little little phrase to the beginning of your refuge so sabha satanang hitaya sukaya buddhang sarnangachami for the benefit and happiness of all beings i go to refuge to the buddha what what does that even mean how can my act of going for refuge in the present moment um for many of us just looking at the people here in zoom we're mostly just by ourselves we're in a room by ourselves and what kind of effect can my this little phrase just adding that to my going for refuge what effect can that have and what does it even mean um, and I think this is this can be just a fascinating question to ask yourself um, perhaps for uh, people who uh, you know are open to the concept of prayer this is not at all new or this is not um, something which is seems at all difficult or at all challenging but say for many people coming to buddhism in america you're coming to buddhism because you're fleeing away from christianity you're intentionally leaving uh, some kind of spookiness of religiosity behind and perhaps um, this concept of prayer has just become unmeaningful for you it lacks meaning because in a christian context oftentimes when you're praying it's intercessionary that is you're praying um may god help or um yeah look after and the people in my life may god look after all beings and in a uh, context of uh, buddhism uh, we have this frequent reminder which was also in the chant that we did that I am the owner of my kama and all beings, sabbe sata, uh, all beings are the owners of their actions, heir to their actions, born of their actions, whatever they do for good or for ill, of that they will be the heir. So praying for someone or praying for God to relieve other people of their suffering, it, it doesn't um, make as much sense. Um, but I feel like this, this prayer and being, yeah, if you want to call it prayer, um, for me, that actually makes more sense. It's a, it's a wish. Um, I don't actually have much context with Christianity. I wasn't raised Christian, uh, Christian um, so I neither, neither have uh, positive or necessarily negative uh, relationships with these concepts. Um, so may I wish, may I pray, uh, for the benefit and happiness of all beings, I go to refuge to the Buddha. Um, and you can actually use this in meditation as a an object to keep you awake so um, in the thai forest tradition people probably know there is this mantra which many teachers ajahn cha ajahn man ajahn mahabua uh, recommended of just budo and you also find it in the pali canon budo just awake it means literally awake and knowing so for myself this is the basis of taking refuge in the buddha it's taking refuge i go to refuge in this awareness this knowing and uh, i do believe and this is everyone has to figure out for themselves uh, what you believe uh, is a benefit for yourself first so uh, 
what does it mean to for yourself to go to refuge to the Buddha? Um, and can you get your mind around this? Uh, I go to refuge to awareness, to awakening, to a non-biased knowing of the, the present moment that's free from <laughs> natural inclinations towards uh, liking all the things that I like or um, favoritism and preferentiality uh, that's um, illogical and unbeneficial. Um, and yeah, for me, I do, I can get my mind around that principle. I do go to refuge for that. And I want to go to refuge for that more. And when you, this can be, when you bring this phrase into things, for the benefit and happiness of all beings, I go to refuge to Budo. I go to refuge to awareness. Uh, I know one monk brother who found it to be a sea change, a game change for him to uh, bring other people, and specific other people for him, to bring his parents into his practice. So he actually came to a point in his monastic life where practice was very dry, like sandpaper. And just thinking about himself, which can be a Theravada uh, pitfall, it's the near enemy of Theravada practice, is just totally basing your practice on yourself. And he found that this can be a skillful means. He thinks, for the benefit and happiness of my parents, of my mother and my father, uh, I'm going to be mindful today in this present moment, breathing in, breathing out, for the benefit and happiness of all beings. And he found that it was huge. It was a motivating factor. And that's what we want. Um, even if you are of a uh, particular um, Tibetan, perhaps, or Dzogchen, or even Chan or Zen mentality that there is no effort that you need to make in practice, uh, still, it's good to be motivated to be mindful, to participate in presence in the present moment. So motivating yourself is very important in figuring out how to motivate yourself. And this can be a very skillful means for the benefit and happiness of all beings. I take refuge in awareness, in, in presence. I take refuge in, in Budo. And that can become more meaningful than just, yeah, the uh, perhaps perfunctory and rote taking of refuge, which probably for most people who say it, um, it really is just uh, a formula. It's just a ceremony. Um, this is a very common ceremony in every Theravada Buddhist country. You just come to a monastery and you might not even meditate. You just say these words, Budang Sarnangachami, Damang Sarnangachami, Sangang Sarnangachami. And it's possibly, you've maybe been doing it since uh, before you even understood what it means, since you were a child. And it really is just words. It's a, a magic formula, perhaps. So repotentizing, making it uh, meaningful for you as a motivating factor in the path for the benefit and happiness of all beings. I take refuge in the Buddha in awareness. So sabha satanang hitaya sukaya buddhang sarnangachami. And we can do this with the Dhamma and figuring out what asp and <laughs> uh, I won't give the poly for this uh, underneath, but as you play around with that perception of for the benefit and happiness of all beings, I go to refuge in the Buddha. You can also play around with the perception uh, for their own benefit and happiness. May all beings go to refuge to the Buddha. So the Pali is uh, Atanang Hitaya Sukaya Sabe Satta Budang Sarnang Gachantu. Uh, for their own benefit and happiness, may all beings go to refuge to the Buddha. And <laughs> you might think, as I did, actually, it is not realistic to think that every human is going to be a Buddhist. And honestly, it's not, yeah, it's, it's neither realistic and I don't know if I would wish that upon someone because there's this uh, almost a backfire effect. You know, if I wanted, if I tried to convert every human to be a Buddhist, 
almost certainly the majority of people would just become more entrenched in whatever religion or faith they already had before I tried to do that. So for me, it doesn't make sense. So for their own benefit and happiness, may all beings be Buddhist. It doesn't make sense. But for their own benefit and happiness, may all beings go to refuge in awakening and, uh, or go to refuge in awareness. I can get my mind around that. I do believe that this is the path, as it says in the Satipatthana Sutta. This is the Ekayana Magga. This is the direct path, or even you can say the, the only path to awakening. Not a Buddhist path, necessarily, but a path of uh, the four foundations of mindfulness, of being present in the present moment, knowing the body, or the mind, or feelings, or dhammas in and of themselves, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. I do believe that that's uh, the only path to awakening, the, the path to highest happiness. I can get my mind around that, and I do wish that for other people. Um, just this past week, I uh, had some, it dovetailed uh, quite, um, yeah, I don't um, necessarily uh, believe in yeah, any kind of, uh, magicness of um yeah consilience or things uh synchronicity um coming together at one time but yeah a week ago um a very close relative of mine uh, was biking and was hit from behind by a car going 70 miles an hour uh hit the ground and has been in the hospital in the icu for the last week uh, and then just today i learned that another very close relative of mine Possibly they had to flee their house from forest fire and today learned that probably their whole house, so however many years of memories and um, uh, memories and life has just been burned to the ground. And what do we do as Theravada practitioners when you learn about um, other people's suffering? Um, you know, you, it wouldn't make sense for me to fly there uh, in the present moment and even, it might not make sense for me to call them first thing, but I feel that this intentionality, Sabha Satanang Hitaya Sukaya Budang Sarnangachami, Damang Sarnangachami, Sangang Sarnangachami. Yeah, for the benefit and happiness of my relative who was in the car crash, um, for the benefit and happiness of my relatives who've had their house burned down, may they take refuge in, in awareness, in awareness which is forward leading and happiness producing. And I do believe that's the best thing that they can do. And I do believe that me, and I, I don't even think this is a belief, I think this is just, uh, yeah, it just seems matter of fact, that even there will be a, both a present moment impact of me bringing others into my, into my mind, into my practice, um, for me, for sure, there might be some kind of um, psychic or pan-psychic, I don't know what I think about that, uh, impact of me um, wishing that, uh, allowing other peoples into my practice. Uh, but in the future, it certainly inclines me to think more about them and to uh, reach out to them in the future. And yeah, I don't know what other effects it will be, but I do think this is a path for them to be happy in the future, regardless of their injury or their level of suffering or their level of uh, their level of loss. Um, may they really take refuge in um, in awareness. Um, that's that's a path of of happiness uh, for them, and I do wish wish that for them. Um, and the same, so. Atanang hitaya sukaya sabe sata budang sarnang gachantu. So, for their own benefit and happiness, may my relatives uh, go to refuge in, in awareness. So, similarly, we can ask the question of the the Dhamma and the Sangha, and of all the 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 precepts. So, um, if I add this to my refuge taking in the Dhamma. Sabha satanang hitaya sukaya damang sarnangachami. For the benefit and happiness of all beings, I go to refuge in the Dhamma. What does that mean? Um, and it can mean whatever is most uh, 
impactful and true for you. Um, so for me, uh, what else do I believe is a true path of happiness for me? Uh, I do believe that letting go of the five hindrances, that aspect of Dhamma is a path to happiness for me. And I can take refuge in that. Uh, yeah. And I take refuge in the Dhamma, meaning I take refuge in freedom from the five hindrances, a mind which is free from greed and craving and ill will and sloth and anxiety, restlessness and doubt. And I also believe that that's a path to happiness and benefit for other beings. Uh, similarly, I can have the wish, um, may all beings go to refuge in this, uh, the happiness that comes from letting go of greed, anger, restlessness, uh, torpor, and doubt. And then to the Sangha. Uh, for the benefit and happiness of all beings, Sanggang Saranangachami, I go to refuge in the Sangha. Um, and this is Kalyana Mitta. This is friendship at its essence. And as the Buddha said, I do believe this is true, that uh, friendship is the whole of a holy life, not just a Buddha, Buddhist holy life, uh, but any kind of life. Uh, this is a path to happiness. And I wish that for myself. I wish it in the present moment for myself. And I wish it for all beings. Um, yeah. Atanang hitaya sukaya sabe sata sangang sarnam gachantu. May all beings, uh, for their own benefit and happiness, go to refuge in Kalyanamitta, uh, find refuge in true, good, spiritual friendship. So I'll end the formal talk there and uh, get rid of this quote, and wish everyone well. So we can open things up to questions. I appreciate you bringing up the, uh, the Adama Saka Sutta, the Mahasu, I'm, I'm mispronouncing it, because I went through a phase uh, about 25 years ago, I converted from Tibetan to Ver Theravada. Then I was kind of rejecting all things in my hand and being a bit negative about it. So I appreciate finding good things in it. Uh, do you want to comment on other good things you found within Mahayana Buddhism? Yeah, um, that's really interesting. I, I have similar, I've had, I have had similar antipathy and kind of distrust and all sorts of fault finding with the Mahayana. So, um, but yeah, coming here to the university, it's been, uh, a very good experience for me to, um, I actually, one, to just get out of my own um, bias against it and, you know, starting off from realizing that there are currently and have been many uh, Mahayana practitioners who are very wise and probably have more insight or certainly have more insight than I, I do. Um, a few insights, maybe I'll just mention two other insights. So it's the Avatamsaka Sutra. Um, and, uh, one other insight from Mahayana Buddhism is specifically into Chan Buddhism. So uh, that, of course, uh, is from Jhana, uh, became Chan in Chinese, and Zen in uh, Japan. Uh, but the Sixth Patriarch Sutra is actually in the Chinese canon. It, one of these days I'll have to do a video explaining the Chinese Mahayana canon because it's very different from the Pali canon in certain ways. So the Sixth Patriarch Sutra is from the Sixth Patriarch, who was a Chinese monk, you know, in the 500, 400, 500, 600 AD. And that's in, in the, the Chinese canon, which you don't find anything later than, say, 300, 400 uh, years after the time of the Buddha in the, the Pali canon. So, um, but yeah, this, basically, I feel that Chan meditation, of which we've not only studied, but practiced with good guidance from people who've been practicing it for decades, uh, is a very unique and totally to the point take on vipassana. So knowing the present moment in a very uh, explicit and no nonsense and direct, direct path. So right in the present moment. So, um, and I feel that's really helpful. And also just um, the recitation of uh, Namo Guan Shi Yin Pusa, 
which is means literally homage to uh, Avalokiteshvara or homage to uh, Guanyin Bodhisattva. And um, again, the, the mantra isn't so important, but I feel like what that mantra is doing is uh, synchronizing or bringing one in in tune with great compassion. And uh, I found that taking that as a mantra, not at all in a thinking that I would have any kind of uh, contact with some being who I, I don't see, um, but actually taking it up, I did have some very um, uh, unique uh, responses. Um, you know, taking that up, I found that after a few days, and again, it could have just been from uh, the mind coalescing on one point, basically from a samatha or samadhi point of view, um, a mind that still, you know, can see more clearly. But um, yeah, I found that I would be able to ask the mind certain things and there would be a response uh, of a wise path forward, which really didn't feel like I was the one coming up with the solution. And is that Guan Yin? Is it my subconscious? I didn't care because it was a good answer. So, yeah. Thank you, Ashan. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. I'm glad you can you can spread Meta to your cat first. What is its name? Uh, his name's Happy. Happy. He's six months old. Very oh. adorable cat. Yeah. Well, Happy. It's good to meet <laughs> you too. Yeah. Okay, Huang La. Oh. <clears throat> Hi. So. Um... You were talking about um, one of your monk brother who were feeling like his practice is very dry, like sandpaper, because he only focused um, on himself. So um, reflecting on that, I feel like when I started practicing Buddhism, it was, and I guess that for a lot of people too, it because something kind of went wrong in your life and you're like, oh, I can't, I can't count on that as my source of happiness. So you kind of like run away, like you trying to escape that suffering. But then at some point, like, you know, things settle down and like, oh, maybe life is not too bad. And then um, you start to feel like you reevaluate how committed you are to, to this path. Um, and all right. Um, so, in so like when you see other people pursue things that make them happy, um, you feel like, oh, I don't know if I'm missing out on some of that because I'm committed to this Buddhist path. And of course, among the worldly happiness, there are some that are low. You know, like going after money and whatnot. But there are some that are higher, some that are more satisfying, I would say. So how, how, how do you think about that? How do you evaluate that as a monk to stay committed? Right, right. Um, yeah, staying committed specifically as a monk, but I think as any kind of dedicated practitioner, uh, when one, uh, yeah, maybe when practice is getting dry and one sees one's old friends or even present friends out having a, a good time. Um, yeah, I feel like this was something which I really, uh, I kind of had a, a love-hate relationship with or a, a ice cold or a uh, ice and fire relationship to. I remember learning about the precepts and then I would look at my friends who were breaking the precepts but seemingly having fun and I'm like, how do I have mudita for these people when they're having fun doing things which I think are actually going to be for their detriment in the future. And um, yeah, I, uh, that is something that I think we all have to get our minds around. And I think this, yeah, wishing everyone for the benefit and happiness of all beings, may they take uh, refuge in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, may they take refuge or may they uh, undertake the precept to refrain from the five precepts. Uh, I would wish that on on my friends and um, but more towards your question of yeah seeing people who are maybe um, getting things which are not which are relatively blameless um, the the happiness of uh, yeah someone making a lot of wealth from doing uh, something good 
uh, I think you can rejoice in that. I think this is a, a practice of making one's capacity for mudita, this sympathetic joy, more robust and less jealous. So you can say that uh, mudita, its near enemy, is uh, actually its far enemy, is is jealousy, where um, yeah, you rather than enjoy the happiness of others, you there's this subtle jealousy of it, like oh gosh, I wish I was out you know, partying or having that good time or having their money. Um, so yeah, just seeing that. Um, and I think this is one area where having a very expansive meditation, um, which isn't so narrowly focused, uh, either in the body or on a particular spot, but more spaciousness to a meditation, you can actually uh, allow those thoughts to exist. Like, oh gosh, I wish I was out having fun with them. And the thought exists, but you can also nurture other thoughts like, well, may they be happy, actually. Um, and yeah, the Buddha did teach. There's a one way of the gradual te teachings. One of the formulations was the Buddha taught uh, generosity, and he taught precepts, and then he taught the way to heaven. Then he taught uh, the drawbacks of uh, sensuality, and then he taught the Four Noble Truths. And so there is this way that the Buddha taught a way to heaven. Um, yeah, there is uh, our blameless happinesses, being really generous, keeping the precepts really well. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, you can think of a bunch. Um, yeah, and seeing if they are legitimate paths to happiness, ways to heaven, then wishing people more of them. Um, so hopefully, I hope that answered your question um, and feel free to come back on later to um, correct if it didn't. Uh, can I just follow Please. up now? Yeah. I guess it's mostly about this feeling of like, oh, you're missing out on something, something you feel like it could be meaningful. Mm -hmm. Like, you see people go travel the world or pursue art or um, think that from like a, um, a non-Buddhist perspective would be like perfectly healthy and perfectly meaningful. But because we are on this path, we set our bar a little higher. Hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, well, so, then, excuse me. But yeah, I was just saying that the feeling of missing out on some of that. Right. Yeah, I think it's good to be uh, mindful of why we're setting the bar higher and what that height is. So uh, for me, the overarching principle is something like Dhammapada verse... 229 if one if a wise person seeing that by letting go of a lesser happiness they gain a higher happiness the wise person lets go of the lesser happiness so if one is on a renunciate path um, then yeah keeping that keeping your eye on the prize so there is a happiness the buddha didn't say there wasn't a happiness in traveling the world and all these other things but uh the happiness that can be still in the present moment, just if one can experience a happier, happier and more joyful uh, joyfulness, just sitting in a lunar, alone in a room, doesn't need to spend the money, doesn't need to buy the plane ticket, then that's a more blameless happiness. That's a higher happiness and in a way. Um, and yeah, if you've got your eye clearly on that prize, then it takes away some of the sting of letting go of those uh, yeah, less gratifying and perhaps more um, impactful or um, yeah, uh, footprint happinesses that leave more of a ecological and um, karmic footprint in a negative way. Um, so keep your eye on the prize. And if you can't, then no problem. Not everybody has to be a monk. Uh, experiment with, um, yeah, it, you don't have to keep the eight precepts all the time. You can go out and travel do all these things and um, yeah, maybe take the eight precepts once a week or just keep the five. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, Mary, please. Oh my gosh, there's so many things in this conversation. I wish we were sitting in a room together and just could could talk. You brought up so many points, Ajahn, and, and so many are coming up. So to Huang, um, I would I just want to say that um, I found that it was days that I didn't practice, days that I didn't meditate were not good days. 
So just out of very self-serving uh, reasons, um, I just find my day goes better when I practice. Um, I also practice when I travel and I, um, boy, there's so many things. So I will get to what I have wanted to talk about because um, like I said, I could go off on so many tangents. Ajahn, I would like you to help me with this. I was looking at, um, I was reading something that defined Buddha Dharma Sangha. Buddha as awareness, which you mentioned, and I think that's a wonderful way. So when I go to refuge with my malas, I think of going to awareness, the awareness of the Buddha. And then the next thing this article said, it translated Dharma as nature. And that is also my understanding that we are nature. And so when I go to take refuge in nature, it kind of stops a lot of this human preference making, human choices. Human, it's just like you can see these things as part of nature and not take them so seriously. So um, I was wondering if that's a correct definition, uh, you Buddhist scholar, you. <laughs> Is that a correct definition of Dhamma or one of them? And to find refuge in nature seems what Thai forest monks do a lot. And um, so just your thoughts on that, please. Thank you. Yeah, that's, uh, that's beautiful. And certainly it sounds very resonant for you and I'm sure it's resonant for many others. And I think that's very important to find what works for one. And uh, yeah, it is, it is a correct translation. I mean, even the Thai word for nature is dhammachat, the the state or the the nature of nature is is nature, um, and yeah, I uh, I think when dhamma is used as nature in Pali, it's more uh, it's less kind of the the idea that maybe um, some people in the West uh, that I've certainly had in the past of kind of like a Rousseauian romantic um, kind of nature outside uh, forests and uh, the Grand Canyon, etc. Um, but just everything. So the cities and the countryside and the forests uh, and just the way things are all encompassing. Basically, the way things are. That's mm -hmm. what Dhamma means in that context. Um, and you do find that in, in the Pali Canon in certain ways. So I think that, yeah, think that works for you. And, and us is part of nature, the four elements, and just being part of that as well. And then the the conditioned is the mind fabrications. It's um, beautiful. Possibly, yeah. It's beautiful. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. And Thank everyone, you, it is, I do wish we had. <laughs> um, Don't you? <laughs> we were all together. Yeah, because it's so rich, all of these refuges and... Um, it seems like we're all trying to really do it sincerely. Um, so would love to hear other people's. I wish we had more time. Um, but thank you, Mary. Yeah, to be continued. Uh, Robert, please. Hi, Ajahn. Uh, thanks a lot for the very inspiring talk. Um, I had one question uh, since we were talking about, I guess, about Mahayana texts and Mahayana practices. Um, recently, I've been kind of experimenting a bit with this, I guess, Zen uh, practice of just sitting as a meditation like so so without any effort kind of just just sitting um being aware of what comes up but without directing any specific effort to like following the breath for example um, so i wanted to hear from your perspective kind of and and sometimes it, this comes easier to me than than following the breath and um yeah I, I wanted to hear from your perspective kind of what do you think um about this kind of practice versus the more directed effort of really following the breath very closely like are they both um you know, do they both can kind of lead to the same insight or same liberation? Is, is one better than the other? Um, and uh, I'm asking because I'm, I'm going on a retreat uh, soon and I'm kind of trying to decide w what I should focus on uh, in, in that time. Uh, yeah, it's a great question and one which I've been looking at as well. Um, in my way of conceiving of it, a lot of Chan 
is almost the third foundation of mindfulness, uh, can be subsumed under that. So knowing mind is mind, uh, ardent, alert, and mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. Uh, that's from the Satipatthana Sutta. And in the end of that, so Satipatthana Sutta, Diga Nikaya number 22, Majjhima Nikaya number 10, um, there's this refrain at the end of that which says, or one sustains mindfulness just to the extent of knowing there is mind. So that's very, that's very Zen. That's maybe the heart of Zen. Uh, but something which the uh, Theravada conception of, of that third foundation of mindfulness, I think hits, and which I think is relevant for Chan or Zen practice, uh, is an understanding about what effort means in that context and what effortless means in that context. Um, yeah, the, the formula is knowing mind is mind in Pali, ardent, alert, and mindful. So there's ardency, atapi, which is an aspect of, of effort. So what does it mean to know the mind with a degree of effort, but inclining towards the most basic awareness? For me, the it's basically the most minimal effort one can do to keep awake, um, to keep that, that knowing. So um, is awareness present? when we're not aware of it, I don't actually, it, it's an interesting thing to think about, um, but <laughs> certainly it's more gratifying and Theravada uh, useful and explicit to be aware of awareness and to give that minimal amount of effort into, into knowing, into a global knowing or this just sitting, but just the just there means you have to put forth that tiniest bit of effort just it's the tiniest bit to just know and it's it's fully valid and um i agree with you that for some people it is easier than a more directed uh say breath meditation or mantra meditation some people who teach those methods will say no you can't really do knowing mind is mind that's a really advanced practice whereas i think for some people actually um, it can come easier, so definitely experiment and um, but be honest with yourself. If it's not working, if you're just uh, dozing off and just sitting becomes just snoozing or just nodding, uh, then maybe come back to a more directed uh, directed method. Great question. Yeah, thanks, Robert. Uh, Richard, please. This has to do with taking refuge in the Dharma specifically the suttas. I'm having difficulty with having authority in the suttas for three reasons. The first is that I understand there are 3,000 of them, um, particularly just the short discourses, much less the rest or the Mahayana versions. And each teacher seems to cherry pick little bits and build something out of that. Also, there seems to be total confusion about the definitions of the words. I just went through a course where the teacher said the word bhavana does not mean meditation, it means cultivation. And that is a huge difference because the effort you would put into cultivating a virtue is very different than meditating on it. And the third issue I have is that it is all so pre-enlightenment. I'm thinking of the Buddha's death sutra, the one where it says that when great men have great thoughts, that causes earthquakes not great women, but just great men. So for all of these reasons, how can one base one's faith in the Dharma in this body of suttas that seem to have so many problems? Thank you. Yeah, fabulous question. And um, for just that reason, I would not suggest taking refuge, certainly for you, um, but even I mean, for me, I would have to add lots of caveats to I take refuge in the Pali Tripitaka. I would have to add caveats to that. Uh, 
many of which you say I would I take refuge in the Pali sutras, which I or suttas, which I believe uh, are very likely the words of the Buddha, which are not inherently um, yeah, and and the non-sexist translations of them. Um, so yeah, so I I do con not conceive of I take refuge in the Dhamma or the Dharma in terms of taking refuge in the Pali Tripitaka. And certainly I wouldn't wish that on all beings because it's just not realistic. Like I wish that my cousin would take refuge in the Pali Canon. Like it's like, forget about it. You know, that's not going to happen in this lifetime. They've got too many, you know, atheist or Christian conditions, which are fair enough. And there's a lot of truth in those, um, in those books as well. And so I'd say for yourself, hold it like that. You know, the sutras, which you find, I feel like I was, led into a growing faith in the Pali Canon because uh, I was spoon-fed them. The first one I read was this Satipatthana Sutra, which Sutta, which I've referenced, which is not so problematic. Um, a lot of thing. And then from there, I read these other sutras, which do not mention devas or other things, which at the time I wouldn't have been able to get my conceptual worldview around. Um, and now it's grown. It's like, I'm not bothered. I actually do have, you know, some kind of uh, belief in the possibility of other realms, and I'm not bothered by the things which are are bothersome. In terms of the sexist ones, um, a lot of, so Pali, like French and German and Spanish, are all, it's a gendered language, um, so there there is a gendering of words and even nouns, or of nouns, yeah, of nouns, um, so you can't really get around of uh, in the Pali of saying that he or she did this or that. Um, in translation, you definitely can. And when I'm translating, if it doesn't mess up the meaning, I'll do um, yeah some kind of broader encompassing translation. And in terms of ones which are really problematic, in terms of only men can do this or only women can do that, um, one will find that they are very few, very few. And the ones that still exist... Um, I am able to class as maybe not, maybe this isn't the word of the Buddha, uh, or if it was, maybe I'm not understanding something about this or, um, yeah, it goes into this other category. Um, it's certainly not the basis of my faith, but it definitely doesn't ruin my faith in, in Dharma as well. So I hope, yeah. So don't take refuge in the, the actual books of the Pali Canon or Chinese Canon, if that's difficult and, uh, or brings up all these questions. And, but I would encourage, there is a lot good there. And so I say, take what, take what's good and leave what's, um, problematic. I hope that's helpful.